Did my kit-built e-bike hold up, or is it just a bunch of crap tacked on to a decent 1990s mountain bike? Six months and a thousand miles later, electric trend, or is the future of transportation here? So right away, I do like my e-bike, but it could be better. It's a 1000 watt AW e-bike kit I got on Amazon and the bike is a mongoose that I got for free on the side of the road. In general, you would buy something like this because it's cheaper than buying a pre-made e-bike, which I mean, it really isn't if you factor in how much time it takes to build it, but that doesn't mean it's not worth it. If you're just making this for the fun of it and you don't care about weatherproofing, it's just for recreation. You're fine with using duct tape to hold some things together. You could make an e-bike in a day, but really you're not gonna get a thousand miles without doing a lot of work. I mean, the pedal assist sensor alone won't work for a lot of people. The cheap stuff is gonna break eventually and the duct tape will need refreshing. But this kit seems to have more power than your average pre-made e-bike, which usually tops at 20 to 29 miles per hour by law. I guess, but you could still buy powerful e-bikes. There's vintage electric bikes, 4,000 watt Roadster that looks amazing and can do 40 miles per hour, but it's $7,000. <laughs> the first 1,000 miles, the first 1,000 miles, the first 100 miles on this bike was the hardest. I mean, at first it was great, but then some stuff started going wrong. We'll call it the breaking in period. After about three trips, my crank arm started coming loose, and every time I tightened it up, it would just go loosen up again. That's because I didn't grind it down far enough to fit the pedal assist sensor, so it was never fully seated, so that was an easy fix. Uh, and then my left shifter broke, which is very optional on a bike like this, but when it breaks, you're stuck in first gear, so you have to use the throttle, because uh, you got no pedal power. I guess in an ideal e-bike, I would only want a rear derailleur, so there'd be a huge gear at the pedals. Uh, so say I had six gears, first would be for steep hills, mid-range would be for low speed riding, and six would be for full speed pedaling, like 30 miles per hour in pedal assist five. So the goal is to have more pedal power at high speeds. Like your typical gearing on a bike isn't ideal for that. The last event in my 100 mile trial period was a flat tire. A uh, very stereotypical bike thing to have happen, but I've never had a tire go instantly flat on me before. Hard to say why, but I do carry a spare tube now. I sanded the rim for burrs, went with a slightly oversized tube in case the weight was an issue, and then used the old tube to make an extra layer of protection for the stem, because that's where I found a tear. And I check my tires every time I go out, which I was doing then, but now I'm super on top of it. You know, these tires are like uh, 65 PSI max, and I try and keep them over 60. But you don't need to literally test it every time, you just kind of grab it and you get a sense of how it feels. Okay, braking period is, uh, the whatever period, braking in period, is over. After that, 700 miles of smooth sailing. Mostly in the winter, which was unexpected. But really, if it's over 35 degrees and dry, there's really nothing that can stop you from riding. Uh, but then it started getting warmer, and I melted my inline fuse. Oddly enough, I noticed it was bulging the day before it blew, and of course I took note of it and planned to do nothing indefinitely. I was just like, oh, that sucks. Hopefully that won't be an issue for me. Uh, it could have been like that for a month, for all I know. I do have the speed limit set to the maximum possible, and the desire to go fast, it is what it is. So the fuse went and it was so melted that I couldn't take it out without breaking it into pieces. And there was so much melt in there that I couldn't put in another fuse. So I just cut out the fuse purse and soldered the wires together because I got places to be. And rather than just buy the same crappy fuse purse, I wanted to get something a little less melty. And I went with these. Uh, three pack cost at least twice as much per fuse, but I can replace one of my pole terminals by mounting this in its place. Two, even if it does melt, I can just swap out the whole thing without having to cut wires or solder anything. So it's something I can fix on the side of the road. And 
three, I have a reason to get rid of this stupid plug and an unnecessary foot and a half of wiring that comes with this thing. So just so you can see what I did, removing the red positive pole terminal and I'm removing the black negative ring connector because it's part of the wire I'm cutting off. I'm making good use of my M5 hex socket button head cap screws I got for this bike. And I'm reusing one of the mounting holes, but I need to drill the other one. And I'm starting with a small drill thing and sizing it up until the hole is big enough. I don't feel like taking off the lid of the box, even though it's probably very easy. <laughs> uh, I mean, I did design it to be easy, but whatever. Measuring how much whatever I need to strip off. And when you crimp, one, use a real crimping tool, and two, crimp hard, because the heat shrink is not what holds this together. And just like last time, I need to widen my ring connectors to fit on these poles. I also like that this comes with little rubber covers. The electrical tape covers I had were supposed to be temporary. So yeah, upgrade. I like it better. Okay, so if this bike has any natural enemies, it's gravel roads and the rain. If I know it's gonna rain, I'm not using it. But if I get stuck in the rain, I don't worry too much anymore, especially if I'm riding after the rain. I've got bags to cover up things, but usually I'm just trying to race home. I have done a lot to make this bike rain tolerant. If I just built it with what I got in the kit, you know, I would never let this thing see any water. And the last thing I added was fenders. The front fender works real good at stopping rain from flying up and hitting you in the face and from filling your shoes with water. Rear fender is a little less robust, but it helps with some undersplashing on the battery. I have sheet metal under the rack, and this goes out a little further in each direction, but I wish it was a giant overkill fender, so I don't know, maybe I'll make something like that instead. Also, check the details of how your bike and fenders are constructed. I have a bike of a similar style, but it's got different style brakes where the wire comes straight down, and you wouldn't be able to put the fenders on but this one has a brake cable that comes in on the side, and through blind luck, I just chose the correct fenders. There are kits that have waterproof connectors. I don't know if they're good enough to ride in the rain with impunity, but why would a company sell a kit that can't deal with the rain by default? Because it's cheaper. <laughs> but also, a lot of people just ride for fun, and riding in the rain isn't fun. Yeah, I don't know, like an average person might put 100 miles a year on this thing, so, I guess this is really for them. But you know what I'm glad I got? A cushy seat. The biggest, jelliest seat available. A decently comfortable seat on this will start hurting after about 10 minutes. Hurting, you know, like you where you're sitting. On the seat. <laughs> I replaced an okay seat with a pretty good seat, and even that wasn't enough, I mean... I made it 700 miles on it, but it was something I didn't like that I was putting up with. Uh, Cause you've got a bike that weighs twice as much as it did before the conversion, no rear suspension. And when you ride a regular bike, you're standing up sometimes. But with this, no, it feels weird. Cause when you stand up to pedal, you sway back and forth, but you got all this extra weight and the motor doesn't want your bike to sway. So you're basically fighting the laws of physics. It's not good. It doesn't feel right to stand up. So you're always sitting. Uh, yeah, super, super great. You know what else is great? Uh, mirrors. <laughs> I don't like riding bikes without a mirror. And this is the best mirror I have. It could be adjusted, but it doesn't slip. It's better than mirrors that Velcro on your handlebar. Uh, and when you turn your head to check, you tend to drift a little left. Uh, which is, you know, the opposite of what you want to do. Rear flashers are also important. And having a high beam headlight 
important as well. I mean, if you're going to be riding in the dark, it's funny, this bike had a sticker on it that said, never ride in the dark, and then there was a phone number you can call for, like, support or to report people. I don't know. This one. I got another one of these. Definitely false advertising on this. It's more like a 1,000 lumens. Uh, it's great. I had a 500 lumen light that just wasn't enough, so I have it as a backup light. They also make great flashlights, I mean, just in general. But even just having a front flasher is worthwhile. I mean, really, anything that can't keep up with traffic should have flashers on it. So that's my six month update, e-bike life, that's what it's like. And just to tack this on to the end, I complain about hitting bumps in the road and wanting suspension or wider tires. It probably won't be my next bike, but I do want to take a moped and convert it into a really powerful e-bike. Actually, my next bike will probably be a very light, less powerful e-bike. Uh, I do want to try rear wheel drive. Maybe I'll just try it first instead of building a bike around it. Other areas of interest, recumbent e-bike. Just putting it out there. Those are some things, and that's it. <laughs>